good evening everyone. Thank you so much for being here. As Olivia mentioned, we are competing with the weather. So it really shows a lot of commitment on your part to be here and um, we are sure you will not be disappointed given the wonderful lineup of speakers that we have um, with us today. Uh, my name is Mehla Kasamdani. I am Director at Critical Connections, an organization that seeks to address divides between American Muslims and society at large through dialogue, analysis, and outreach. We are delighted to be partnering with the Karuna Center um, for Peace Building, which is right here in Amherst, and we'd like to thank them for all their support. Um, as we're aware, um, diaspora communities have a critical role to play in shaping public opinion and US policy towards the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. Um, given the events of this past summer, um, a whole new range of um, voices and organizations have emerged to, um, within, with, within various diaspora communities, Jewish, Muslim, Christian, to um, influence the narratives and the various narratives surrounding the conflict. Um, and yet some of the conversations within and between these communities and groups have been very divisive, have been very polarizing, um, and don't always advance the cause for just peace. So we thought this would be a good time to sort of perhaps step back and take stock of um, the evolving role of diaspora communities as it currently stands today. Um, and to help us sort of understand this role, we are joined by a wonderful panel that we will introduce shortly. Um, and they will share their insights to um, help us understand better shifting trends within these communities and to see how they impact the trajectory of the conflict um, as it's developing. And to also uh, help us understand the evolving leverage and influence that these diaspora communities have here in the US and to also shed light on various initiatives around here in our communities that have tried to reduce polarization and improve understanding. Before we introduce our uh, panel of academics and activists, I will invite Olivia Dreyer of the Karuna Peace Building Center to um, come and say a few words about her organization and the event today. Olivia. Great, thank you. So once again, welcome to everybody. Um, as Melika mentioned, I'm director of the Karuna Center for Peace Building. Our director of our, president of our board, Jenny McKenna, is also here. So if you have any questions about the work of our organization, come up to us afterwards. We've basically been in existence since 1994, so for some time. And we work in parts of the world where there's been violent conflict, doing peace building and reconciliation work. So often across deep, deep divides. And it's been a real pleasure to be working together with Malika to address some of the divides in our own country. We've had a series together on bridging Muslim, non-Muslim divides, and then this evening looking at the role of diasporas. And I wanted to say just a word to set the tone for the evening, though looking around, I think I'm totally preaching to the converted, so to speak, mm -hmm. um, that you know this is an issue that can be around the, the role of the diaspora uh, around the Israeli-Palestinian conflict in particular can be very, very polarizing. And I know I've been present for some very, very contentious conversations. Mm -hmm. And I think tonight we want mm -hmm. to be able to speak openly mm -hmm. and from a multifaceted perspective about all the very, very challenging issues involved, but to be able to do so in a way that uh, actually deepens our understanding. And we often feel in our own work, when we work in conflict countries, that there's a, a real art and uh, growth to be had from really trying to walk in the shoes of the other. So to really step into ways of seeing the world that may be very, very different from one's own. So we hope actually that we have a mix of perspectives within the room and that we'll be able to learn from each other by hearing more about those perspectives. So. Did we, maybe just to say, after we didn't mention yet the agenda for the evening, mm -hmm. did we? No. Okay, so the plan is we're going to invite our speakers to each speak for about 15 minutes. And then, since we want you all to be really, really engaged, we'll take about five minutes or so for you to just 
cluster yourselves where you're sitting in groups of three or two, whatever <laughs> makes the most sense, and just there, share your thoughts on what you've just heard. And then we'll move from that into a kind of broader discussion, question and answer, but also a more general discussion with everyone together. So. Great, thank you, Lydia. So without further ado, I'm going to start um, introducing our speakers in the order in which they will speak. So first we have um, Dr. Dove Waxman, um, who is a professor of political science and in international affairs and Israel studies at Northeastern University and the co-director of its Middle East Center. An expert on Israel, his research focuses on the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, Israeli foreign policy, U.S.-Israel relations, and diaspora Jewry's relationship with Israel. Originally from London, England, Professor Waxman received his BA in politics, philosophy, and economics from Oxford. He moved to the United States for his graduate studies at um, the School for Advanced International Studies of Johns Hopkins University, where he received his master's and PhD degrees. He is the author of The Pursuit of Peace and the Crisis of Israeli Identity, Defending slash Defining the Nation, and the co-author of Israel's Palestinians, The Conflict Within. He is a regular contributor to the Israeli newspaper Haaretz and a frequent commentator on television and radio. So with that, I'd like to invite you to us. Yes, that's okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Do you need me to speak with the microphone or can you hear me? Okay. Just the mic. Mic the microphone. Okay. So thank you for the introduction and, and for the invitation to be here this afternoon. It's a, a pleasure. I, I know I've only got about 15 minutes, which uh, as a professor is almost impossible for me to talk for just 15 minutes, but I will, I will do my best and I will try and uh, if you want me to uh, be quiet, just let me know. Okay, so I'm, I'm here to talk uh, just a little bit about uh, the American Jewish community and its relationship with Israel and what's happening particularly in terms of American Jewish attitudes towards the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. And um, when you think about American Jews and the Israeli-Palestinian conflict and their relationship with Israel, uh, what immediately comes to people's minds is the pro-Israel lobby, right? This is what immediately people have in mind. Uh, and in particular, APAC, the American-Israel uh, Public Affairs Committee. This is kind of the best known, the largest, most powerful uh, organization within the pro-Israel lobby. And many people would look at the activities of APAC or look at the activities of the pro-Israel lobby in general, and from that, uh, infer a lot about the attitudes uh, and views of the American Jewish community as a whole, right? So essentially assuming that the that whatever the position of APAC or the pro-Israel lobby in general, uh, that uh, is representative necessarily of the views of American Jews as a whole. Um, well, that's basically false. Um, so what I want to do um, in, the, in the time that I have very briefly is to, uh, is to talk a bit about what's happening within the American Jewish community as a whole, and particularly uh, the, the attitudes of uh, American Jews toward the conflict. Um, and one of my main points is going to be that essentially, um, notwithstanding the, the expressions of ardent support and solidarity uh, for Israel and for Israeli governments that you hear from organizations like APAC, um, that behind the scenes, uh, away from the microphones and the cameras, um, there's a lot more discord and a lot more debate happening today within the American Jewish community uh, than there was in the past. Um, and that American Jews as a whole are a lot more critical of uh, Israel and or specifically of Israeli government policies than what we might call the American Jewish establishment or organizations that, that claim to speak on their behalf. And, and to back this up, I'm going to refer specifically to uh, the results of a survey um, which was conducted last year by the Pew Research Center, which is a very authoritative polling institute. Um, and they interviewed uh, 3,500 uh, Jews across the United States, so a fairly large sample, the largest uh, survey of American Jewish opinion that's been conducted in more than a decade. So it gives us uh, a fairly good sense of American Jewish public opinion. Um, and one of the things this survey uh, revealed was um, significant skepticism among American Jews concerning Israeli government policies. And just to give you one finding from the survey, 44% um, 44 of American Jews believe that settlement building, Israeli settlement building in the West Bank, hurts Israel's security. 
Uh, that's a plurality. Um, and that view is not expressed, not represented by American Jewish organizations like APAC, which are, um, they don't actually support settlement building, but they're silent in terms of criticizing it. Um, and I think that, and I'm going to refer to this survey on other occasions. I mean, my basic argument is that what's happening behind the scenes is that the American Jewish relationship with Israel is becoming a lot more conflicted and a lot more ambivalent. Um, and that support for Israeli government policies in particular is no longer automatic. So in the past, there was a tendency uh, um, within the American Jewish community to kind of rally behind Israel and to support Israeli government policies. Um, and what's changing today is not, and I want to underline this point, it's not that American Jews care less about Israel. It's not that they're less attached to Israel, as is often uh, the claim. In fact, uh, the surveys show that American Jews emotionally are just as attached, are just as uh, care just as much as, as pre prior generations did. And this is true, by the way, for young American Jews as well. Um, they're just as attached to Israel, they care just about, as, as much about it. What's changing is their willingness to, to support Israeli government policies, and in particular, uh, Israeli government policies uh, concerning the Palestinians. Um, uh, it's, so it's specifically, what's changing, in other words, is political support, not what we might call emotional identification or emotional attachment. And it's very important to distinguish between these two things, because oftentimes people talk about, simply about support, and they are equating two very different things, support for the, the country and support for the policies of its government. So uh, when it comes to the conflict, where do uh, American Jews stand? Well, if I had more time... Um, I, I would break down, and perhaps in the q and I'd be happy to break down the various um, groups and camps, if you like, uh, within the American Jewish community. Um, but if I was just to try to characterize where, where most <coughs> American Jews, where the majority uh, are, are in terms of their attitude towards the conflict, I would describe them as conditional doves, by which I mean that they, they want peace and they support Israeli territorial concessions, uh, toward the Palestinians, but they're also, which makes them doves, but they also worry about Israeli security and they're deeply suspicious of Palestinian intentions. So, for instance, in the Pew survey that I mentioned, while many of them um, are critical of Israeli government policies and believe, in fact, that the Netanyahu government is not sincere in its pursuit of the peace process, in other words, they don't trust essentially the, the statements of the Netanyahu government, they're even less likely to trust the statements of the Palestinian <coughs> Authority and the Palestinians. Only 12% believe the Palestinians are sincere in the peace process. So um, they're, they're not by any means, you know, simply uh, uh, doves who are embracing the peace process. They, they, they agree with those on the right that uh, Israel might face a potentially severe security threat if it withdraws from the West Bank. And they also agree with those on the left about the demographic threat to Israel as a Jewish state and a, as a Jewish and democratic state if it continues to stay in the West Bank and to all over the Palestinian territories. So in some sense, um, they're deeply torn, they're conflicted, and hence I described them before as ambivalent. They're conflicted over these, over these beliefs. Um, they want, they support land for peace, but they're worried about the security risks of land for peace. Um, they want Israel to end the occupation, but they don't want Israel to take any security risks. Um, they want a Palestinian state, but they're worried about what kind of a threat that Palestinian state might pose for Israel. These basic attitudes have not changed significantly um, over the last two decades, in fact. There is an underlying stability in these attitudes that hasn't really changed. That's not to say that they don't fluctuate in response to events. So, for instance, during the uh, Second Intifada between 2000 and 2005, support for a Palestinian state declined during this period of time. Um, and, but since then, it's, it's risen back to its, uh, to its earlier level. So there's some fluctuations depending upon what's happening on the ground, but not, uh, not a great deal of shift. What is shifting, what is changing, and what's changing in quite dramatic ways, is not so much American Jewish public opinion, but American Jewish public debate, mm -hmm. right? American Jewish public debate. In other words, the public discourse around the conflict, which was previously something that was not expressed publicly, or something that one, uh, what often happened behind closed doors in the conference rooms of American Jewish organizations or in the living rooms of American Jewish families, this... P debate is now 
really spilled out into the open. It's happening in very, very uh, public ways. Um, and it's also becoming, as I'm going to talk about in a bit, uh, a very, very bitter, a very polarizing debate, as was mentioned before. Um, so very briefly, what are the main um, contours, what are the main issues in this debate? When it comes to the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, and this is a debate, by the way, that goes beyond the conflict. This is the debate about the nature of Israel as a state, as a, as a democracy, about the relationship between diaspora Jews and the state of Israel, about the future of Zionism. There are many bigger issues, but at the heart of this debate uh, is the Israeli-Palestinian conflict and Israel's treatment of and policies toward the Palestinians. So one of the issues uh, that's subject to debate uh, is the question of Israel's responsibility for the conflict. In the past, it was generally assumed and accepted by most American Jews that the responsibility for the conflict did not lie with Israel, that the responsibility for the continuation of the conflict lay either with the Arab states or with the Palestinians. And now, according to the Pew survey, as I said, 48%, almost 50% uh, believe that the Israeli government is not making a sincere effort to make a peace agreement. Uh, only 38% believe that it is. And strikingly, only 26% of 18 to 29-year-olds. Mm -hmm. So just over a quarter of 18 mm -hmm. to 29. In other words, the general view is that the continuation of the conflict is at least partly, if not wholly, but at least partly, Israel's responsibility. Um, another issue is uh, concerns the two-state solution. Is it still viable? What's the future of the two-state solution? Um, most American Jews, and there is a, a strong consensus within the American Jewish community in support of a two-state solution, um, the majority still believe that is possible, but there's a growing debate over when it may become, or if it's already become, impossible to achieve, and then what. Uh, so this is another issue of growing debate. And finally, the question of what this means for Israel as a democracy. There's a growing concern that the, the continuation of the conflict and the occupation is eroding uh, Israel's democratic values internally. Um, and its treatment of its, Arab, its own Arab citizens, who make up 20% of the country's population, even its tolerance for dissent from Jewish citizens, is now a subject of growing concern. So these are the kinds of uh, issues that are really at the centre of American Jewish debate. Um, a debate, as I said, which is no longer conducted privately, behind closed doors, but it's very much uh, uh, happening in public. Um, it's also becoming not only more public, but increasingly ugly. Um, this is a, a really toxic debate. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, those on, on the left and the right uh, frequently vilify each other, uh, so uh, accusing each other of endangering Israel's survival. So the right mm -hmm. accuses Jews on the left of being anti-Israel, of being disloyal, of even being self-hating Jews. Um, while the right, while the left accuses the right of being fascists and racists, this is the kind of very highly charged language uh, that is happening. The right blames the left for contributing to Israel's international isolation uh, and for undermining Israel's national security. The left blames the right for contributing to Israel's pariah status and for endangering Israel's future as a Jewish state. So there's this increasingly uh, ugly, toxic debate that's happening, and it's having an impact. Up, um, on the grassroots level of Jewish communities. Mm -hmm. um, so, for instance, uh, members of a synagogue, of the same synagogue, are falling out. Rabbis in surveys are now uh, expressing their fear of talking before their congregations mm -hmm. about Israel, lest some of their con congregations or members walk out or resign their membership because their own communities are so bitterly divided. Uh, Jewish film festivals are often face criticism for the kinds of films that they can screen. Uh, they worry that they might lose support from major donors if they screen films that are critical of Israel. Jewish federations uh, and charitable organizations, communal organizations, across the board, uh, the issue of Israel and the debate about the Israeli-Palestinian conflict is becoming something of the third rail in American Jewish life today, becoming an increasingly divisive and increasingly polarizing issue. Um, so just to sum up, um, what does this mean? What are the implications of this? Well, the first one, I think, is clear, um, the, that for the American Jewish community, it means that Israel and support for Israel, which was once the unifying factor for American Jews, American mm -hmm. Jews have long been divided mm -hmm. by religious differences in terms of religious practice and identity. So support for Israel was the great unifying thing that brought together the American Jewish community, and that is no longer the case, or increasingly less so. Uh, instead, 
uh, Israel is going from being a unifying force within the American Jewish community to a divisive and a polarizing force. And so the very integrity, the cohesiveness of the American Jewish community is at stake. In terms of the conflict, what this means is that uh, American Jews are no longer uh, bystanders in this conflict. They're no longer just sitting in the bleachers, you know, uh, offering Israeli governments their support from afar. They're increasingly becoming very vocal and active participants. What this means is that Israeli governments on the left, for instance, who may be wanting to make a uh, peace agreement with the Palestinians, are likely to encounter sustained and strong opposition from within the American Jewish community. Right, from the right-wing uh, sections of the American Jewish community. Conversely, Israeli governments on the right, or in the center that, that are resistant to making uh, territorial concessions for the Palestinians, encounter resistance and opposition from the left of the American Jewish community. So Israeli governments now are constantly having to be aware, not only of their own domestic constituents, their mm -hmm. own citizens, but also given the very uh, essential support that American Jews provide in terms of uh, ensuring American government support for Israel, um, as well as financial support for Israel in terms of uh, American Jewish philanthropy. Israeli governments are increasingly aware that not only are they dealing with the Palestinians in the conflict, not only are they having to be responsive to the interests and concerns of their own citizens, they're also going to be having to be very aware of American Jewish opinion. On certain issues, this is particularly important. I'll end with this. Um, we can take the issue of Jerusalem, for instance. On the question of the future of, the Jeru of Jerusalem, about which, by the way, American Jews are opposed to any division over Jerusalem, uh, any Israeli government in the future will have to be concerned about how the American Jewish community is going to react. Because ultimately, the American Jewish reaction is also going to have an impact upon congressional mm -hmm. reaction and the kind of support for a peace agreement. Mm -hmm. So these things are, are added complicating factors in a conflict which, uh, needless to say, is complex enough. So, okay, I will end there. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Professor Waxman. You gave us so much to think about. That was very interesting. Um, next, we have Professor Emily Curie. Uh, she is a doctoral candidate at the Graduate Center the City University of New York, where she is specializing in international relations and comparative politics. She is a visiting scholar at Northeastern University's Middle East Center and an adjunct faculty at Emerson College, where she teaches global political communication. She holds an MA in international relations from City College and a BA in political science from Hunter College at CUNY, is that how you say it? Her research interests include Middle East politics, identity and diaspora politics, politics and religion, and Muslims in the West. Her current research examines the policy engagement <coughs> of Muslim American organizations and its role in the construction of Muslim American identity. Professor Kirit. Thank you for that introduction and for inviting me to speak. I'm very excited to be here. Um, and as uh, that introduction suggests, that I will be speaking to you about Muslim American organizations specifically and the role towards the Palestinian-Israeli conflict. So why Muslim Americans would mobilize around the Palestinian-Israeli conflict is not immediately clear. Right? To begin with, the majority of U.S. Muslims are not from the Middle East and an even smaller minority are from the occupied Palestinian territories or from Israel. More generally, being faced with the post-9-11 crisis domestically, one would expect their organized groups to dedicate limited resources to issues of domestic civil rights, to dealing with the domestic crisis mm -hmm. facing the community. <coughs> What we find is that even though this is the case and domestic civil rights mobilization comprises sort of the core of these organizations' concerns, they don't shy away from foreign policy engagement, right? So um, U.S.-Iranian relations, the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan, the so-called Arab Spring, democratization in the region, these are all foreign policy issues that they're concerned with. The Palestinian-Israeli conflict, to our topic today, 
is uh, without a question their most sort of their focal foreign policy issue. And I think that in order to understand that prominent role that the conflict plays for US Muslims, we need to understand symbolically what the conflict means. First is, of course, the symbol of Jerusalem as a holy site for Muslims, right? as the third holiest site in Islam, Al-Aqsa Mosque. So m most of the, the people I interviewed for, for my research would refer to Jerusalem and its importance right? as, as uh, the heart of the Muslim Ummah. This is a common way of referring to Jerusalem. So that, that's one aspect of, of, of its importance. Secondly, the conflict itself is significant, symbolically significant. Why? Because I think for many Muslims in the US and around the world, they see the conflict as their last sort of unapologetic reminder of colonial meddling, US interference in the region. <laughs> so I think keeping that symbolism of the conflict in mind is important to understand the broader engagement, the broader, broader concern with, with the conflict. Um, the conflict, however, is defined, interestingly enough, in pretty standard terms, as a territorial conflict between two people, Palestinians and Israelis, over the same land. And this is really important because although they're speaking as a minority, as a religious U.S. minority, they're very careful to define the conflict not in religious terms. So it is not a perennial sort of conflict between Jews and Muslims on the, on the other hand, right? It is a territorial conflict, it is a political conflict that has been worsened by U.S. interference, mm -hmm. negative U.S. policy meddling, if you will. So their solution? is to fix US policy, right? A more just, a smarter US policy. And that is basically what they're mobilized around. Now, um, again, because of time limitations, I don't have uh, the necessary time to go over all, all their policy engagement, but in general, <coughs> broadly speaking, their policy centers on three key things. One is recognizing <coughs> a unifying grievance, establishing a, un a unifying grievance, and this is important also to unify the broader Muslim American community. Secondly, those culpable for that grievance are located, U.S. policymakers who are pursuing um, a misguided foreign policy, and lastly, they present a solution. The solution is changing that policy, right? And discursively, it's interesting when one reads their policy recommendations, because discursively they're mixing sort of three discourses. One is international law, upon which all of their recommendations are basically based. Secondly is American values. And thirdly, Islamic values, Islamic jurisprudence. So the mixture of these three discourses is where their policy recommendations emerge from. So just to give you an example of what I found particularly interesting, there are many, many examples. But for example, when they define the uh, separation war, right? I'm quoting, they define it as the wall separates people from their land and severely breaches the right to freedom, the right to property, and the right to gain a livelihood. Mm -hmm. And now, of course, we can hear the echoes of the Declaration of Independence and that quote defining the wall. And that's important because the audience they're trying to reach is a U.S. audience, mm -hmm. U.S. public opinion, and U.S. policymakers. So the language they use in order to do that, to present their demands, is very important and it's strategically very significant. Um, so these organizations I focus on, and if I didn't mention it, there's two major Muslim American organizations um, uh, at the national level. One is the Council for American Islamic Relations, CARE. The second is the Muslim Public Affairs Council, MPAC. So these are the two organizations na at the national level that uh, are, uh, if you will, lobbying, interest groups engaged in lobbying US foreign policy. And they engage in classic lobby tactics, classic interest group tactics. Education campaigns, policy reports, speaking to uh, uh, the media, right, about their positions, and trying to engage policymakers. Um, now, what is interesting is the current Gaza crisis this past summer, right? 
which also highlights their use of social media. They're very strategically sort of smart use of social media as a tactic. And um, there are a number of, um, of, of campaign, social media campaigns, if you will. I'll highlight three which I found particularly interesting. One was a letter writing campaign uh, initiated by CARE where they um, handed out basically templates of letters to members uh, uh, attending the mosque and they asked to, asking them to sign this letter. They collected over 20,000 letters that they sent to their Congress members. So it was a very mm -hmm. powerful uh, symbol of the Muslim American community is against US funding of killing civilians in Gaza. That was mm -hmm. the, basically the core of the letter. The second campaign was called 101000, and it was an impact initiated campaign. And it basically called for praying for the last 10 days of Ramadan, which was the, the Gaza crisis was taking place during Ramadan. So praying for the last 10 days, contacting 10 elected officials, and donating $100 for humanitarian relief. So again, very strategically uh, sophisticated forms of mobilizing, of uh, uh, combining both contacting elected officials with sort of a donating money for humanitarian relief. The last tactic used, which was really very interesting, was also connecting, discursively connecting what was happening in Gaza to what was happening in Ferguson. The shooting of the young mm. uh, African-American male who was shot and killed by the police, right? So what these organizations were saying by mixing these two sort of uh, examples is that human rights violations are the same. It doesn't matter if the victim is in the US mm -hmm. or if the victim is a civilian in Gaza. These <coughs> issues are not separate. These issues are intrinsically connected, right? And that also served to highlight structural violence, which also these organizations focus on. So whereas the media, the narrative of the US media was that Hamas was to blame for the latest uh, uh, rockets being launched in northern Gaza, these organizations didn't really focus on who was to blame for the last skirmishes taking place. They focused on structural violence, meaning the occupation. So unless they're saying so to policymakers that unless you deal with that, mm -hmm. with the occupation and the, vi and the violence it engenders, you're not going to solve the conflict. Mm -hmm. Similarly mm -hmm. to what, was, what happened in Ferguson, making that connection. If you don't address police brutality, police violence, structural problems, that another young African-American kid will unfortunately be shot. So again, just showing this strategically very sophisticated uh, moves that these organizations are making. Um, I guess to close it off, and we can talk about all of this more during our Q&A, um, I'll, I'll pose a question to all of you, which is, how representative are these organizations of the larger Muslim American public? And that's a real question, right? The White House iftar, which took place um, you know, that, this last uh, summer, for those of you who don't know, the White House since the early 90s has been holding these iftar dinners, um, mainly as a symbolic act of inclusion to show <coughs> support for the Muslim American community. Um, a lot of people initially, in the early years especially, and particularly after 9-11, saw that as really positively, right? As uh, at least, right, things are not changing, but at least symbolically we're being included, we're being invited to, to our White House, right? In the past couple of years, you've started hearing voices of dissent. Voices saying that, well, actually, these symbolic ways of inclusion are actually given the administration, the government, the excuse that they're engaging the community mm -hmm. and not highlighting the relevant issues, which are continued surveillance, continued civil rights violations, right? Mm -hmm. So there, were, there was a group of 100 scholars wrote an open letter calling for the uh, wh uh, White House of Star this past summer to be boycotted, okay? Especially in light of the fact that one of the executive, the president's ex executive director of CARE, one of the most important Muslim American civil rights organizations was being surveilled by the government for since 2002 to 2009. This became, uh, the documents were leaked and this was also another controversy that was taking place in the summer. So CARE boycotted the event, they did not attend. 
among many other uh, uh, scholars and civil rights activists. MPAP and many others did, event, did attend, right? During the event, President Obama went on to lecture his guests about Israel's right to defend itself and about Hamas, Hamas's blame for initiating the attacks. And you can imagine the sort of uh, controversy that this further engendered afterwards. Um, people were heavily criticized for having attended to begin with, for uh, basically uh, being pawns in the government's game. And th that is the argument now. And I think the most relevant uh, controversy argument, if you will, now taking place among the community is what is the best way to achieve change, mm. right? Do you work from within? Do you engage as these organizations are trying to do? Or do you actually achieve change by protesting from the outside, if you will? And this, I think, is where the community is now, uh, the debate that the community is trying to have. And I think I'll be interested in hearing your own perspectives um, during our discussion. Thank you. so much that was fascinating um, and actually before we move on to our final speaker I just like to say that we did try very hard to get a Christian American sort of perspective uh, for this discussion we tried very hard to get some of the churches to sort of you know give their viewpoint but because of scheduling difficulties we were not able to find someone so um, you know we really apologize uh, about that um, and then last but not least we have here Dr. So Albert um, who is a very close friend and a mentor in many ways. Um, Dr. Anver is a pulmonary and critical care specialist, and he's currently the mayor of the town of South Windsor, Connecticut. He is the first Muslim, Asian American, and physician to be elected in Connecticut and New England as mayor. He is the founder and co-chair of the American Muslim Peace Initiative, which works to strengthen interfaith understanding, intrafaith understanding within Islam, and interfaith understanding between Islam and other religions. Dr. Anwar was a charter member of the Anti-Defamation League's Interfaith Coalition on Mosques, a national coalition formed in 2010 to support Muslim communities facing discrimination when trying to legally build or expand mosques around the US. Mm -hmm. Dr. Anwar has been on interfaith missions to Israel and Palestine, Two years ago, he co-founded the Jewish Muslim Alliance in Connecticut, a group of Jewish and Muslim families that meet on a monthly basis to discuss local, regional, and international issues. Dr. Anwar. Thank you. Hello, everyone. So actually, before I start, I have to tell you, I was in that iftar at the White House. Oh, you were? <laughs> so it'll be an interesting, uh, and actually, it happened in such a way that I was, uh, I was sitting closest to President Obama, and I got some interesting email and conversations, and I, we can probably have a discussion on that at some point. It's another full conference topic within itself. So I'll tell you a little bit about me, and, and uh, I'm approaching this from a different angle altogether. And I'm, I'm really honored and actually humbled to be in the presence of academicians who have actually data information about uh, the, the, the picture and, and, and what needs to be done. So I, I can start off, I was born and raised in Pakistan. And, and, and as, as my growth and as I was uh, recognizing uh, various things in, in, about life and so on, I learned about uh, the society telling me that I should not like my Jewish brothers and sisters. And every time there would be a conversation of some kind, and there would be a suggestion that you should not like them. And I would say, how many Jews have you met? And the people who were telling me not to like the, the Jews had never met somebody of Jewish faith. So I came to the U.S. in 1991 and uh, went through my training. And of course, during the course of my training, I had uh, an opportunity to interact and, and learn from many Jewish professors and uh, also individuals. And I've had extensive conversations, and it became quite interesting and important for me to try and engage this community more and more from an American Muslim perspective. Um, there are fault lines between communities. In the United States, the biggest and the strongest and the most dangerous fault lines exist between uh, Muslims at this time and the Jewish community. American Muslim and the American Jew. And, and that is for a variety of reasons, but, but that is what I felt was an important area for us to invest in and look at. But it's more important um, in my in my 
the journey in interacting with the Jewish community, what I learned was, um, and again, it's not one particular group, one particular segment, but, but a variety of different people from one spectrum to the other, that the people are um, extremely passionate, family-oriented, committed towards their, their passions, and also um, who have a very close link with Islam with respect to how the faith is understood and in some ways practiced. You would almost hear somebody, a rabbi, speak something and you would hear yourself or see yourself nodding about saying, hey, that, that sounds like my, my faith tells me the same thing too. So the more I learned, the more I recognized the similarities were a bigger issue than, than the, the, obviously the land and, and the political challenge that we are living in. So that's, that's one component that I want you to keep in the back of your mind is, is that's important. And then when you see this, you really feel that here there are two brothers or two sisters who actually have so much in common, but their lack of interaction, lack of care for each other is resulting in a future which is unhealthy, which uh, is, is almost like something that um, their father, Abraham, would not be appreciating what's going on. Mm -hmm. So you say you have a responsibility. And, and then the next question comes is that we are all taught in our faith, if you're supposed to live our faith, we actually have a responsibility to leave the place that you've been to better than how you found it. Mm -hmm. And then right now, the way things are, we are going to leave this conflict, this world, this situation much <coughs> worse than we found it. Mm -hmm. And that's unacceptable to me. So that's the starting point. Okay, no is not an answer, we can't do it this way, let's find out how can we get these two brothers to be together. So how do you do this? And, 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 and again, the off the table is the issue that you're not going to get no for an answer. Now here's the ground reality. When we have a Muslim community in general, when they have somebody of Jewish faith who's going to come and support them, broadly speaking with some of these organizations, the, the person of the Jewish faith who's going to come and speak in a public se section or public conversation would be from extreme left. And, and, and then the Jewish community would actually attack them and say, you're a self-hating Jew and, and so on. And then that's how it, it, it starts in, in that conversation and the conversation does not get anywhere. Mm -hmm. Then on the other side, when the, the Jewish community gets somebody from the Muslim community, they get somebody who is way on, on the left actually, not even on the radar screen at times, they're so <laughs> far off. And, and, and that person is quote unquote representing the Muslims. And, and, and the Muslims listen to this and they actually get upset and then yelling and screaming and, and so we continue to get divided. The people who actually need to have the conversation are never in the room together. Mm -hmm. so, so that was, uh, again, it's, it, and to me it was somewhat of a no-brainer that was going on, but um, so I tried a number of different things. Of course, interacting with the people, interacting with organizations on the Muslim part, and, and I'm not a part of any organization as such, but, but I know the people on the care side, I know the people on the, the APAC side um, as well, I know the people on, on and, and it's in, interesting because they're, they're my friends on all of these spectrums. And, and uh, I'm, I'm interacting with them and I'm at least sometimes trying to say, you know what, I think your, that word is going to hurt them and so on. I'm trying to, and then there are these almost like th these conversations that are happening in Israel and Palestinian areas indirectly. I sometimes find myself doing some of those things behind the scenes with some of these organizations because some of the individuals, I know them and I respect them and they're good friends of mine. So while this is happening at the organizational level, I do see the limitations. That, that these organizations can only go so far. And um, so I, I tried to look at what are the different ways. So um, in 2010, there was this earthquake in Haiti. And, and I, as a physician, I, I went to Haiti to try and help out, but I realized that uh, more needed to be done. So I came back and I wanted to start a school in Haiti. But what I wanted to do was, as we wanted to unite the community in my town of South Windsor, to actually work towards a a, a important responsibility that we have as humans mm -hmm. because at end of the day our faiths should allow us to live our faiths. So part of that thing that unites us is to take care of our fellow humans. Mm -hmm. They say, well, let's take care of the children in Haiti and build a school together. So I got some of our Muslim community members and the Jewish community members to unite together to form a South Windsor Haiti school. And then, and then we have Christians as well and then it, it turned out that we never talked about each other's faith. Mm -hmm. 
but we were living our faith to try and help the people. And before we knew it, we were actually good friends, we were having conversations, we had developed a respect for each other. We did not have a conversation on the, the politics at all, but there was an uh, understanding and respect and we knew that in this coordinated effort to try and, and, and help people, we will be available and trust each other. And that was a very important <coughs> trust building effort that we had and this process still goes on and we have made great friendships except we do not necessarily talk about the elephant in the room. So mm -hmm. that's, that's another limitation. So if you're not having those critical conversations, then it's okay, you're humanizing each other, which is a very important aspect. Uh, because uh, to me, if anybody now is going to say something negative about anybody of, in the general scheme about Jewish community, I, I, it almost looks like they're talking about my family. Mm. So I would at least get, get upset because I am now connected with them because we have mutual respect and love for each other, for, for who we are and what we do. But now to get the right people in the room. So uh, two years or so ago, I actually had, uh, I had enough interactions with the Jewish community. I said, I want to get about seven Muslim community members, uh, couples, uh, families, who would be uh, center or right of the center and left of the center, but not on the extremes. And I want to have seven uh, Jewish community members and I want all of them to be on the, the extreme right, or at least be APAC representatives, mm -hmm. or, or not representatives, but members. So um, we, we started this journey about two years ago, and then uh, we call ourselves the Brunch Bunch now, two years <laughs> later. So every month we would actually have a brunch together in, in each other's homes. So we'd open our home and everybody would come. And, and, and two years ago, things were not as bad. Um, and, and it's all, 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 it's a moving target. I mean, mm -hmm. uh, things are not bad is all relative because things were bad at that time, but they were much worse now. So in, in those conversations, um, we started to recognize the fact that we are very similar. We actually match the people with respect to professional backgrounds, mm -hmm. age groups to some degree, and, and, and educational background. And in this effort, <coughs> we, we interacted with each other, recognized the fact that our feelings about what is going on in America is, are very similar. What we are worried about the future of our children in America is very similar. So literally alignment on the issues in the U.S. was very, very close. You could actually agree on all things and they would never have a conversation, but we were not approaching the topic. Mm. So, and, and, and we would have amazing moments, great food, mm. and, and, and food is a, a peace builder uh, in, in many ways, uh, in, at least initially and after that is restlessness. So, uh, and, and as we moved in, in this direction, we, the conflict was taking a new shape. And we needed to have the conversation. And, and as an American Muslim, it's very interesting when you are an American Muslim and you are interacting with the community, so the questions that come are, are quite interesting in the beginning. Is They said, oh, so why don't you guys uh, uh, all unite to say no against extremism? And those same questions that we have heard for the past 10 years, 12 years, 14 years, and then you actually almost have a, put the recorder on and have the answers. And these are the frequently asked questions, or let's have a real conversation. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and those questions were asked and we answered and we talked. And, and as we move forward, then this conflict happens. We actually, the Muslims in the room says that we want our Jewish brothers and sisters to actually have empathy about what's going on. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and, and we have empathy because uh, when those, those three uh, uh, boys were murdered, um, to me, they actually, when I looked at them, uh, we don't know the realities, who killed what, and uh, they're a diff different perspective, but when I saw that there were three boys who were murdered, I saw my children mm -hmm. in them. So I cried, and I actually cried collectively, and then joined hands with my Jewish brothers and sisters, and I said, I, I don't accept it, that what has happened is wrong, and we cannot allow this to happen in our societies anyway. And, and about a week or two later, there were all of these uh, children who were dying as well, but it was difficult to get the same Jewish brothers and sisters to come out publicly, to be able to say the same. And, and that started to raise some questions in our minds that, why is it that I can always go, or we can always go in and, and privately and publicly say certain things, but, but you have difficulty the rest of the And so, in, in these conversations, because they're now our friends, they're, they're, they're people who actually, it's when we have a brunch punch and you somebody's got a chest pain or, or a leg pain or back pain, 
we have the brunch at their home if it is planned. They say, I will go to the hospital later, but I don't want to miss this because I enjoy it so much. Mm -hmm. So that's the level of friendship that we have. And then these friends are not having those conversations. So we sat down and really had the conversation. And, and uh, we had one level of conversation, and it led to a lot of uh, tears and, and, and difficulty for everyone to express themselves. Because deep inside, we are all humans. We shape our narratives, shape our prisms based on our experiences and our feelings and our insecurities and our passions. But <coughs> the humanness is the most critical piece of that puzzle and how do we get to that is, is important for all sides. So two years later, um, I'm a different person than I was two years ago before I went into that room with the first brunch and, and so is everyone else in that room. And what we are hoping to do is, we, we are now actually going to, we, we had another set of conversation and, and that conversation left us all dehydrated because everybody cried in that mm -hmm. room. Uh, we had 14, 18 people who were crying and hugging and, and, and praying together for all the people who had died. Mm -hmm. And now these are people who have not, who, who are on the, on the political right. It, it's not your, your other groups that, that are always passionate and, and are talking about justice and peace and so on. This is a different set of segment of people that we're looking at. And, and on both sides, uh, with respect to understanding the Jewish narrative, I am much more uh, educated on that, much more uh, able to actually counter my own Muslim community when they're going to say something, I'll be able to respond to them in a manner which is going to help them understand where the, the Jewish community's narrative is. Um, and again, when I say that, I, I say APAC more so than, than others. Um, so that, that's where we are at. It's, it's a work in progress. We are hoping, uh, we, we are actually going to plant a tree in, in, a, in a mosque in Connecticut, and we're going to plant a tree collectively together in, in a, a synagogue in, in Connecticut, and that's going to be one of the efforts. And we are going to try and create a way to create this a viral process because the solutions would have to come from us and, and the people in the community. We don't control what's happening in, in, in so far in the Middle East, but we at least can control what's happening in our neighborhoods. Absolutely. I'll stop. Thank you. Thank you all. I'm feeling your 15 minutes. You've given us so, so much. much to think about, and there'll be lots more time in our discussion phase to go deeper, so thank you. So what we would like to do is take a little time amongst the group here to digest what you've heard. And what we would suggest is just form yourselves in little groups of three, but it's so much more interesting if you do it with someone you don't know. And I have the feeling you're sitting next to people you do know. <laughs> so if you don't mind just getting up and moving around and then just in little clusters of three, gather together. And the per we'll take five, seven minutes, we'll play it by ear. But the purpose is um, to digest what you've heard, pull together the questions you have for all three, but also think about your own experiences in the in diaspora groups in this country around the Palestinian-Israeli conflict. As, as we've heard from all our speakers, there's, there's conflict between groups, but there's also conflict within groups. And while I suspect most of the people in this room are not on the extremes, you've had conversations with people who are. So think about your own experiences of diaspora groups and about the question of how diaspora groups in this country working within themselves and between each other might be able to play a more constructive role. Because I think, as you said, we actually do have an influence. Public opinion has an enormous influence. Mm -hmm. And it was fascinating to hear those statistics from the Pew polls last summer. So. Alinia, I'm just wondering, maybe before we completely open it up, should we have the panelists, if they have any birth? Because I don't think we ever give them the opportunity to maybe respond to each other, or if they have a remark to make. Mm. And that's, then a good point. that's a good, good point. point. Thank you. No. They were having a lively conversation. There. <laughs> <laughs> well, I would just say something that came up in our the conversation that we were just having, um, is that my own approach to thinking about the, the um, 
the tensions and the spillover of the conflict, the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, we were talking about a spillover from uh, the Israeli-Palestinian conflict into the tensions uh, between the Muslim and Jewish communities in the United States, and even greater tensions in Europe. Um, my own view is to see that the, this isn't a conflict between Muslim and Jewish communities, but rather within these two communities. It's a conflict that runs between the, the more uh, pluralist, open, tolerant, liberal, if you like, interpretations and approaches uh, and wings of these communities and the uh, more closed, militant uh, wings of these communities. So rather than think of these as, mm -hmm. and this was part of what I was saying, you know, we should not think of the American Jewish community as a, as a monolithic community. Mm -hmm. uh, we have to think of it as, as one that is uh, today uh, subject to a, a, a very intense battle or debate between these two uh, orientations. And this debate that I describe that's going on within the American Jewish community is going on within every uh, faith-based community, in, the, in mm -hmm. not only in the United States, but around the world. I think this is one mm -hmm. of these central kind of divisions. Uh, so it's really, you know, as I say, it's a conflict that runs within, on which uh, different wings of these communities can find alliances and the militant hardliners reinforce each other um, within, within this conflict. Anything else? I, I can add to that is that while these are intense conversation in the Jewish homes and maybe in the Christian homes, it is a violent one in Muslims mm -hmm. because you're seeing the war and the extremist mindsets who are actually the number one group of people who are murdered uh, by these extremists are Muslims. Mm -hmm. And this is a Muslim, the so-called Muslims were killing the Muslims. So that's, that's how crazy mm -hmm. it has gotten. The other interesting aspect on the U.S. side is that the apex shift towards the right and that the Republican presence and influence, Republican Party's presence and influence in APAC is, is, a, is a, something that's quite recognizable and palpable now. Mm -hmm. And then how that is going to have an influence and, and, and in the part of the country where we are sitting and having this conversation, mm -hmm. how that is going to actually have an impact in the broader parts of the country is going to be uh, something to, to see and, and watch for. Um. I guess just uh, before you all uh, have your own questions, I have a question of uh, our mayor. And the question I have that you mentioned is th that you attended the iftar, right? And I am personally, for uh, sort of uh, self-interest reasons, very interested in hearing your, uh, your perspective on the event itself and on the, more broadly on the issue of engagement versus protests from from outside, and I don't know if that is a question that the audience... Uh, it's a very interesting question. So, so there are two, three things. Uh, at one level of that is, is if I get free meal, I just show up. <laughs> <laughs> but, but, but having said that, actually, um, I was asked to come as the mayor of the town of South Windsor. Mm. So I represent the people of my town of South Windsor. Um, and I have a responsibility to okay. be there when mm -hmm. the president of my country is calling me to be there. Mm -hmm. um, so it's an honor for me and it's an honor for the people that I represent. So that was one of the reasons. Now, even if I was going as a Muslim, actually the American Muslim community, I have been fighting and working on, on different projects. We are actually helping educate young boys and girls who are uh, Muslim children who were actually bullied. These are post 9-11 children who were actually told go home, mm -hmm, you don't mm -hmm. belong here, terrorists, all sorts of names to them. And, and these children, we are being actually educating them that this is your country and this you have to be engaged. And how do you get engaged uh, with the political process to actually reach out, work within the political system and then work? Because working outside of the political system does not get you very far. And, and, and it has its limitations. And also we do not want some of these young boys and girls to actually start to work outside the system and become, get preyed on exactly. by the extremists on the internet, which is a, a real threat. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. with that in mind, I actually mm -hmm. have been pushing for that. And then now when you're in the room, so you're just going to walk out of that room just because one of the things that you don't agree with. It, 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 and again, politics is something where you do not necessarily agree mm -hmm. uh, one with everyone. And, and my wife is here, so I, I usually use the term I said, I do not necessarily agree with everything my wife says, but I follow it. <laughs> so, but that's how it is, that you have to not agree with everything a person yeah. says, but you actually have to agree to disagree, disagree on certain things and respectfully do that. And that's what I think is the broader issue that the Muslim community needs to grow up. It's, it's, uh, 
you, you have a, an event that's in honor of your, your faith. It's being recognized in, in the White House, and you'll be a part of it. Other faiths are having the same opportunities. So next time around, why would the president want to be embarrassed? Because the people are going to make public statements, you're invited. So they're going to say, well, it's easy for me not to have you. And then that's, that's uh, and it took a lot of effort of a lot of people way back during President Clinton's time, I think, when this was all started, mm -hmm. so. Thanks. So, thoughts, questions? I mean, the thought that, hi, I'm Naz Muhammad, and I've been living here for many, many years. What <coughs> impressed me is that, you know, we can't really make changes in the, policy changes, but I think we can make changes within ourselves and amongst ourselves. So I think if we just do, if we just do a drop of change, and that multiplies. And I think that, was, that is the most important thing that gives you a sense of uh, ownership and uh, well-being, because you can do something other than you know, feeling uh, helpless. So that's where I got reinforced. Thank you. Yeah. Hello, everyone. Well, okay, I'm Wahid Sultan. I'm just coming from Palestine. I grew up in Al Khalil, Hebron, the city of Ibrahim. So uh, maybe I want to, one of these, one of, uh, I have many points about. Uh, what I listened today. First of all, I feel that Israel become problem to the Jewish around the world more than <coughs> it's a solution for what's happening in the Holocaust. And the other thing I feel, maybe, uh, that the new generation of Jewish now, they're not affected about the feeling of, of victimhood like their fathers and their uh, grandfather. So they are not excited in Israel, and Israel is okay. And you know that Israel built on the issue of Holocaust, and vict we are victims, and we have to have land on all of this issue. So I, I, I feel that the new generation of Jewish around the world, they don't, they don't uh, affected by the but like their fathers or like their grandfathers. And the other thing I think the, the issue um, of, uh, we are, for example, and I'm from the city of Ibrahim alayhi salam. So my grandfather, for example, his boss in work, he was Jewish mm -hmm. and Palestinian Jewish before Israel. Mm -hmm. And it was, uh, you know, there is the relation between the Muslims and the Jewish. It was so nice, mm. and you know, if you, if you, uh, what I say, you know, all of the, uh, all of the problems, all, all of the suffering that the Jewish suffered, not from the Muslim, not from the Arab, at all. So this is one of the things, which is, I think even in our food, you know, how we okay, about the biha, you know, how we sacrifice the uh, everything, and we have method. I don't know how to translate it to kol uh, endel yahudi, which is eat with the Jewish, uh, like you know. So I think this is very important. Israel become incubation, not Israel. This Israeli incubation is a problem for the two sides, and I think. And the other problem is what is on the table between the PA and Israel, which is really not good, and it is not peace, it is something else. I am, I believe, I'm suffering. You know, they destroy my house, Israeli soldier, and they kill my uncle, and I don't want, and they, I, I've been in jail three times. But not this issue. I, I want peace, but peace which is a sustainable peace. Mm -hmm. we, we need peace built on <coughs> on love and and without in, uh, and to go from the point of fear and scared and we are, okay, we can accept each other it's very simple and i think from if in the arabic and islamic 
culture, there is a lot of forgiveness. Mm -hmm. We can forgive. I think in in Quran, for example, there is a lot of example of forgiveness. Always, if you forgive, it's good for you. This is, uh, I think, we have. If there is, if the Israeli people admit that we did mistake in Nakba, I think we will forgive and we will live together. Thank you. Thank you. Does anybody? Uh especially from the younger generation, want to add anything to what was said before we go back to our panelists? We do have different generations represented. Hmm? Yes, yes. please. Uh, my name is Omnia. I'm a student at Hampshire College, and I kind of wanted to address what you said about kind of building peace and coalitions and conversations between Muslims and Jewish people in the United States. And what I want to do is really maybe push back against the idea that the issue is that Jewish and Muslim people in the United States don't get along or that there's kind of like, that the issue is lack of conversation between these two different groups. Because I think these types of dialogues, a lot of times, are super, e they equalize, you know, they wash over a lot of the history that's there. And so, when you say that the issue is that people don't know each other, first off, it kind of harkens back to Huntington's Clash of Civilizations, where he says, you know, the reason that, you know, Muslims all over the world don't get along with other people is they're just different people, they're different, they have a different history. So one, it kind of goes back to that ideology, but also, um, I don't know, I think there's a question of, um, when you have these conversations with people and when on the one side a people is very oppressed and you know, has put up with so many years of state violence, you know, kind of taking it past the interpersonal. Where does the, you know, the state violence, the institutional violence, the institutional power or lack of power go into these conversations? Does that make sense? So a little bit, the limits of conversations, all very well for conversations that humanize, but what you're saying is that it doesn't address some of the underlying power differentials mm -hmm. and how far does it really get? Is that Yeah, and I'm saying it's kind of problematic to say, I think, that the root of the issue is that people don't get together and talk mm -hmm. because don't I know think there's so many systemic issues. And as you said, you kind of got these people to talk and there was still, you said on the Jewish side, a lack of empathy. And so how do we move past that? How do we move mm -hmm. past having conversations, getting people in a room, you know, and also addressing the systemic um, power dynamics. Okay, great. So, I think specifically directed to you, but perhaps others can comment as well. Thank you for your question, Omnia, and actually, Wahid, your, your question, I'll, I'll link it together in some, some ways. Um, when towards the, the end you said that if there was an apology, there will be forgiveness. If, if I heard you yeah. right. Mm -hmm. And what, what happened in, in some of the rooms is, is a conversation which is private, but, but at the same time talks about um, the very dynamic. When somebody who has been in a position of authority, in the position of power, is a position of responsibility. And within that position, if actions are being taken on a regular basis which are not right, uh, which were against uh, the, the rights of an individual and, and in hurting them in, in ways, children, women, adults, and so on, that leaves the people who are supposed to be protecting the ones who has done that with some, some heaviness. With, with, in other words, I'll, I'll be much more open. Um, the Jewish community who is actually uh, for lack of a better word, apologists for Israel's action. They have a huge burden to carry. Because uh, what was right in front of us, there's no justification 
that one can make. And, and, and when people try to do that, it hurts them inside. Mm -hmm. It's painful. <coughs> and, um, and, and I, I don't pretend to be solving the problems, what's going on over there. I feel that there is a responsibility of our communities who are here in the U.S. to do what we can. But, but end of the day, what's going to happen, and this is maybe the, the, the optimist in me, feels that if we can win each other's hearts and minds and openly talk and apologize for my ancestors if they've done anything wrong and the ancestors of the others who have done something wrong or the current families that are doing something wrong and, and openly have a conversation and, and accept wrong is done, then there is a hope of forgiveness, peace, and conversation about what needs to be done rather than a, a position that I want this and this is my right. The next level of conversation is what is our responsibility going forward because this is not right. And, and, and so it, it, it's, the, the hope is that if we can have those little internal battles inside of us which make us restless, uh, going into that room to have that conversation is not easy. It is probably one of the most difficult things because uh, when you have seen children die, and you've seen them die in a, in a manner which uh, it's harmful, hurtful to you, you are actually going to have a discussion with somebody who, from our perception without the conversation, is that they justify that it's okay. It's very difficult to be in that room because there's no other conflict where people are able to sit down in, in that kind of a situation where something so bad is happening on a very regular basis. Um, Again, um, it was not easy, it is not easy, but it's a step in the direction of acceptance and moving to the next level, but, but the hope is something like that would happen at some point over there. Mm -hmm. And that's a prayer. Because uh, collectively, all the people of, of Palestine and the Muslims and all the Jews, we all have to hug each other and cry and, and bad things have happened, but, but we need to move on to, to make a new future. And again, that's again the optimist in me who who's alive and thriving every single day. Um, I don't know if I answered that, but that's my attempt. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'll, I'll add to that uh, and to, to, to your question, which I think raises to two really important points, right? One is how we define the conflict, as I said in my, in my talk, right? If we define the conflict as a territorial one, right, between two people over land, so a political territorial conflict, then I think that's a valid question. Is, is having sort of interfaith discussions conducive specifically to solve the conflict, mm. right? It may be very helpful in order to um, mitigate relationships and do all sorts of wonderful things. But is it addressing the conflict, which is a territorial political conflict? And the second question is this discursive association between the Muslim American community and the Palestinian-Israeli conflict, which we sort of take for granted if we notice the way we're speaking about it here. But is, is, is that, should that be taken for granted? Mm -hmm. why, why are Muslim Americans so concerned with the Palestinian-Israeli conflict, right? I mean, I mentioned that in my talk, right? Sure, the role of Jerusalem, and sure, the notion of sort of this like uh, degree of oppression. But do they have a specific stake? I think that's something we, we need to, are we, are we speaking, is the Muslim American community speaking for Palestinians? Should they be? So these are really interesting questions that I think your broader question raises. So um, just quickly, I'll make a quick couple of, well, maybe not quick, but I'll quickly respond. I'll try. Um, <laughs> first of all, I think the question that you've raised is, is one that I've certainly heard from many Palestinians in, in the West Bank, in the Gaza Strip, who, after years of those kinds of dialogue mm -hmm. uh, encounters and programs with Israeli Jews, who have certainly felt that, you know, that, look, it's all very well to sit together and eat hummus, but, you know, you're occupying us, and this mm -hmm. is not, there's an inherent inequality here, and this is the elephant in the room, and it's not just about getting to know one another. And I think those, uh, those are, uh, I mean, so I think that's a valid uh, concern and complaint, and it's one of the reasons why a lot of the uh, Jewish-Palestinian kind of peace-building and dialogue projects that flourished in the 90s 
you know, failed uh, to sustain themselves during the Second Intifada and afterwards, precisely because they didn't address these issues. I would say, you know, I think if, if that's all it is, is getting together and eating hummus, then yeah, that's not enough, right? The point is that that should be the first step. That's not the end of a process, that's the beginning of a process, right? The idea is that you can't necessarily get into the room and start talking about occupation and rights, etc., because you're not gonna have a conversation for very long. But you first of all have to try to, I guess, humanize each other. And this is after, you know, decades of, of systematic dehumanization mm -hmm. on both sides. By doing that, you can then begin maybe over time in a very slow and, and difficult way to start to address the actual structural issues and actual political issues. But if you believe that it's simply enough to get people in a room together, then yeah, that's definitely <coughs> not the path. Um, going, I just want to, uh, a couple of points that you made. First of all, in terms of uh, younger American Jews, uh, I think that's true. I think. Uh, you're right that the, um, the, no, the, the, the notion of victimhood, I mean, partly this is simply uh, the, the, the distance from the Holocaust, therefore the, the, no, the strength of that mentality and that sense of uh, historical sense of persecution and victimhood, I think, is uh, weaker among young American Jews than, than older generations. That doesn't, as I say, translate into less attachment to Israel, they're just as attached, but their relationship to Israel is different. They don't see Israel, for instance, as an insurance policy. I would know, could you literally so, you know, just in case we want to have the state of Israel. So they still support Israel, but they support Israel for different reasons. And they're also more willing to disagree with Israel, precisely because they don't see Israel as the, the last refuge for, for Jews. Um, they are much more willing to criticize those aspects of Israel and its policies that conflict with their values. And so the occupation being one of them. So I think, older generations, not just of, of American Jews, but of diaspora Jews in general, often failed to, often felt, well, if, they, if, you're, if you believe in Israel, if you believe there should be an Israel, that means you support, you, you, you have to support everything it does. You have to, mm -hmm. and I think younger American Jews, partly because they are less, they are more willing to see that, that Israel <coughs> and the Jew, and, and Jewish people can be, are not only victims, but can also be victimizers. And it's very difficult for people who have internalized deeply this, notion of historical identity as a victim are not not just Jews but to also acknowledge when the victim can have power and that and, and that that power can also turn them into victimizers um, and I do think that, that that is shifting but it is a very difficult thing and that's I think why sometimes it's very difficult for Jews to have that conversation because um, the when you're attached to a specific kind of identity to see yourself then as not just weak and powerless. So I don't know if it's, I think, I think for many uh, American Jews and, and diaspora Jews, it, 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 there's a kind of cognitive dissonance. It's very, very difficult to actually begin to acknowledge power, that, that, because there is this very, very power in the United States or power in Israel, Palestine. Um, so I think it's very, very hard to do that. For, the final point I think is a very, powerful one, if I may say, in terms of it, the forgiveness. Because I think, um, specifically now with Israeli Jews, and this in, in, in terms of the hope for how things might change, the, um, there is an increasing um, recognition that, for instance, Palestinians were expelled, that Israel, that Palestinians did not, if you, and this is mm -hmm. re reflected in surveys, mm -hmm. right, that, that the, that the traditional Israeli narrative that you know Palestinians fled at the encouragement of their mm -hmm. leaders or Arab leaders, uh, that traditional narrative is really largely, not entirely, but increasingly being discredited. And there is a growing recognition uh, that that in fact Israel, you know, did commit even war crimes and mm -hmm. that Palestinians were. Israel. But what part of what stands in the way of translating this historical awareness into a political? act or in, in to, in to, uh, uh, compromise in terms of negotiations is the fear is, is the fact well if we acknowledge this what does this mean what will this open up to so i think what you're saying about the possibility for forgiveness and reconciliation is very powerful because i think that can unblock uh, it, uh, some of the resistance mm. that israeli jews and, and diaspora jews feel to acknowledging what the 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 well, there's some historical acknowledgement, but translating that, saying, well, you know, 
there needs to be, it's not just about a top-down process of, of between the PA and Israel. It's about, um, you know, forgiveness and reconciliation, which is a decades-long process. But I think that message is, needs to be coming across much more powerfully than it is doing. Uh, Dr. Waxman, just to follow up on what was just sort of raised, and, and we'll sort of uh, go back to the audience, is, um, you know, uh, 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 Vahidi, he, he, you brought up the question of forgiveness. And that is something which I feel is almost a dirty word among activist groups here. And it's very, um, you know, it strikes me that somebody from Hebron, who's come directly from Palestine, has come up with that word. And we saw sort of similar sentiments sort of come up when, you know, the, the three Israeli boys, when they were killed, um, and there were Palestinian families who went to sort of, you know, sit shiva with, with the family over there. And they also, there was, a, I think, a, one of the uncles of Abu Khadir, um, who said, uh, you know, our liberation lies through the heart of Jews. And I was struck by that statement as well, because I thought that perhaps here, you know, some of the pro-Palestinian groups would never, uh, uh, would never sort of relate to that at all. Sort of the, uh, the you know, American sort of, you know, Palest uh, American activists for Palestine wouldn't. And similarly, you talked about Israeli Jews recognizing that yes, you know, we expelled them during the Nakba. But how many of Israeli, uh, how many of American Jewish uh, uh, community members would acknowledge that fact? So I'm just sort of, what I'm trying to say is like, what role does the diaspora on both sides play in sort of perpetuating the negative, uh, the negatives on both sides, while the people who are actually living mm -hmm. together and have to live together for the, you know, the next uh, however many hundred years, they are perhaps a bit more amenable in their mm -hmm. own ways and yeah. on their own terms than perhaps the diaspora and that's just something that's absolutely i mean if i can just yeah in terms of american uh, i mean american jews and diaspora jews in general have for many years been wedded to a kind of very mythic image of israel mm -hmm. um and and that myth and the this notion of of this kind of you know israel <coughs> The, the book, the Exodus, or the movie with Paul Newman. I mean, this kind of fantasy land, which they didn't really know anything about, and they didn't know much about Israeli history, and they certainly uh, had no, had really uh, very, very little no uh, awareness of the actual history. That has been something that has, I think, contributed to uh, the conflict, and and obviously because in in, not, in all cases, diaspora communities, not just in the Israeli-Palestinian case because they don't pay the same kind of price, obviously, right. Right. Uh, therefore um, they, there's less pressure for them to have to confront their myths. Um, whereas, mm -hmm. I mean, the case of Israeli Jews, first of all, directly speaking, they they've, may have heard from their grandparents what they did in the war. Like, they've heard stories. I mean, it's a much more immediate existence. Their sons or their daughters or themselves have, have seen the occupation. They've served in the territories. They've gone to Hebron. <coughs> not increasingly, not that many Israeli Jews actually have gone to Hebron any longer. But that's, but the more you're exposed to that, the more you're exposed to the reality, the, the more challenging that's going to be for whatever uh, illusions, fantasies, or myths you want to maintain. And, and I think, I mean, one of the projects that, 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 um, that happened that's happening now is actually bringing American Jews to, to the West Bank to see for themselves. Uh, because, I mean, one of the things that, that is really, it's hard to exaggerate the extent of ignorance, not only within the American Jewish community about some of these things, but also within among Israeli Jews who basically do not know what's happening mm. on the other side of the barrier. Mm. So, so yeah, I think you know, bringing stripping that away um, on on all sides is. I mean, I'm an educator, so that's obviously my belief. But I think that's key. Jenny, you, oh, sorry, go ahead, please come in. No, um, uh, I think Malika, what you mentioned is is, is very critical. Um, recently, I think it was New York Post who did the whole article on on APAC, uh, and and. Uh, it, it's worthwhile. It's a very long article. New Yorker. New Yorker. New Yorker, sorry, New Yorker. And it's a very, very interesting where it talks about uh, the APAC themselves talking that uh, the president of APAC making a statement that he can go anywhere in the Congress and he can get 15 senators to sign even a napkin. And he says the largest uh, gathering of the U.S. Uh, members of Congress uh, after the, the, the State of the Union is actually at the APAC meeting. So um, it's, a, it's a reality, unfortunate reality, if whenever something is happening in that area, 
you suddenly have a number of different resolutions that come which are just uh, feel good resolution empowering resolutions which say we stand with israel and so you have to say that every every war every new uh, thing that's going on which is obviously flexing of muscles by by the jewish certain segments of the jewish community who are very influential mm. um, and and that leads to the challenge is that are they part of the problem because mm -hmm. the people over in, on ground are probably more if you look at the, the votes in Knesset on, on the war situation, you probably have more resistance on, on that side in, in, the, in some of the votes, at least not recently, but in the past at least, you would have people say that we don't agree with what's going on. But in the U.S., no Congress member would be able to hold their position, at least that's their perception, if they were to say, take a position of that capacity. I think that's, that's where some of the conversations need to happen. And the other, the next level of complexity in this is, unfortunately, we are losing our leverage as Americans uh, because we, we don't have as much resources and we are actually also um, not as uh, valuable as we were to a lot of countries that we were five or ten years ago. Other power players are in the picture as well. How would that impact this conflict in Venezuela? So, Shelley and then... Oh, you did. Okay, please. Uh, to what extent do you think the General Assembly resolutions in the, in the UN and some of the <coughs> agencies in the UN and their uh, actions with respect to Israel have sort of struck a counter uh, pose in, in the United States. Uh, do, you, do you sense a, a kind of a, a pushback against the UN posture <coughs> in Congress. So, uh, I guess that's the, the question I have. Um, well, I mean, in concrete terms, um, you, Congress has retaliated against uh, UNESCO for admitting Palestine as a member. So there has been some specific uh, consequences which have been damaging to various UN agencies because of uh, you know, for the last few years, the Palestinian Authority has uh, has undertaken a campaign for Palestine to be upgraded as a state, in, not just in, in the UN uh, through the UN General Assembly, but for a host of other agencies like UNESCO. So this has had a, this has had an impact. And, I mean, the US is a major uh, donor to UNESCO, so this has a knock-on impact on many UN activities around the world. Um, in terms of Congress. I mean, at the end of the day, it's true, and this, and this is, I mean, it's true what, what Congress will pass, uh, you know, has laws on its books which will automatically affect uh, US funding, um, and it's true that, you know, APAC has a huge influence in Congress, and that partly uh, leads to Congress to do these kinds of things. At the end of the day, though, um, I think uh, it's, it's the administration, it's the White House that really, I mean, we tend to kind of say, oh, it's Congress, that, but when it comes to the Israeli-Palestinian issue, when it comes to UN votes, ultimately, um, if the US administration, this is the Obama administration, if they really wanted to prioritize this and, and, and do, you know, they, they could, they, they don't. It's, there are other issues. They've made a calculation, rightly or wrongly, that there are other issues. There are other issues in the Middle East, Iran being probably important, number one, now ISIS and other issues that are more important to them. And therefore, in, in there, they don't want to have to deal and have a big dispute on, over the Israeli-Palestinian issue uh, or with the United Nations while they have other issues on their agenda. And that, so I think a large part of it has to do not with um, Congress or APAC or, or with uh, what the Palestinians are doing in the United Nations, but really on the, the fairly real politique calculations of not just this this White House, but previous White Houses as well. I mean, in the past, it was the Iraq War, and Iraq was a bigger issue for the Bush, for the George W. Bush administration than Palestine, than Israel-Palestine. Um, Clinton did belatedly deal with it, uh, but for the most part, most U.S. administrations, despite the lip service that they pay, because it it serves U.S. interests well to pay the lip service, don't really feel that it's it's the most important issue. It's important to populations, they need to be seen to do something, but they're not really gonna spend the real political capital that they that they need to if they want to address this issue, I think. So I have a 
Hi, my name is Elida. Um, so, I guess my question also speaks to the international community more so, because when we talk about diaspora communities, we're talking about a global phenomenon. And I have a real, real interest in understanding, um, because I'm coming from a place of ignorance in this, is how communities, Muslim and Jewish communities and Christian communities around the world, not necessarily in the US or in Palestine and Israel, have reacted. Um, either to the U.S. investment or just to the conflict itself. And I was wondering if any of you guys could expand on that. And maybe especially since last summer, it would be interesting yes. to... Well, since you probably noticed that I am uh, British, that, uh, I, I mean, yeah, this is a really, I mean, I, I speak just in, the, in Europe. This is... Um, having a, a really big impact in Europe and in, and in Britain, where, where I'm originally from, but you know, you've seen um, the the spillover of this uh, manifestations of anti-Semitism now in in Europe, in France, in Germany, Spain, in Britain. So um, the 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 uh, diasporic communities, um, in the sense of you have in in the case of France, you have a very large. Uh, North African community, um, of whom they're both Jewish and Muslim. Um, and so what complicates it, it's not just a reaction to the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, and that's the, the trigger. You also have um, long-running issues going back to actually the, the, uh, the end of French colonialism in, in the case of North Africa, uh, and the memories, and both mm -hmm. communities' memories there. There are ways in which they've been integrated or not integrated into French society, uh, their relationship with the French police, etc. So when we talk about the Israeli-Palestinian, that's really the trigger. I mean, the events, the, the war in Gaza, and then, you know, we, we have had um, violent demonstrations and, and violence taking place between Jews and Muslims in France. It may be seen as a reaction to the conflict, and that's often how it's portrayed, but I think there's, there are, in, in, in many cases, deeper issues at stake, issues particularly uh, for um, the Muslim community in France that, rel that relate to their exclusion mm -hmm. and um, dis sense of disenfranchisement in France. So uh, it's often, we often focus it, uh, this is about the conflict. I think it really isn't. I think the conflict becomes a vehicle, and in part because the Palestinians in somehow, in some sense, are, are symbolic, as, as, as Emily was saying, is symbolic also of a broader sense of mm -hmm weakness and disenfranchisement that speaks to the experience of Algerian Muslims in France or Turks in Germany. Um, it's, it's not really, I think, about the past. And, and just the same as for American Jews who, um, you know, uh, or British Jews who defend, it's often not really about what's happening in Israel. It's about their own identity politics back home. A lot more, a lot of it is much more local um, than we often, uh, I take credit, understand. Yeah, and I'll add to that. Uh, with, with, the, with the Muslim American uh, community, right, we are here sort of uh, using the term diaspora, mm -hmm. sort of unquestionably, right? But that's, that's, that's something that should be questioned. Are Muslim Americans, do they constitute the diaspora in the real sense of the world? Sure, they come from many different places, but is that enough? Actually, the discourse among Muslim Americans is away from defining themselves as a diaspora. Mm -hmm. They're defining themselves as Americans, as an American minority. Mm -hmm. But they, a diaspora mm -hmm. sort of uh, assumes mm -hmm. that there is a place of return, a mythical or real place of return. Mm -hmm. Muslim Americans are not interested in that. They're mm -hmm. interested in, especially post 9-11, with establishing roots, right? Mm -hmm. With being an American, a US minority. So the term diaspora is, is a problematic term. It's not one that should be taken for granted. And uh, similarly, their foreign policy mobilization, their foreign policy engagement also merits questioning, right? Why would a community that is facing so much uh, uh, domestic pressure, so many domestic concerns, civil rights violations, right? Why would they focus very limited resources? These are small organizations that don't have big budgets, that are, they, they're volunteer mainly, right? Why would they focus their political and resource capital on engagement on the Palestinian Israel conflict, on what is happening in Syria, right? Now, part of what I argue my research is similar to what uh, Doug was saying, is that that is about more their identity as U.S. Muslims than it is necessarily about these various foreign policy 
uh, <coughs> circumstances. Mm -hmm. They're speaking as an American minority mm -hmm. with something meaningful to say to their government, right? Seeking what is in the best interest of their country, the United States. Mm -hmm. So their policy mobilization revolves around U.S. long-term interests. They're saying that current U.S. policy towards the Palestinian-Israeli conflict is not working, not necessarily so much because um, Palestinians are suffering as a consequence, sure, but their main concern is that this is not in the best interest of the United States. Mm -hmm. This is mm -hmm. leading to hatred, again, anti-Americanism around the world, and it's, it's simply not in the best long-term interest of our nation, and that's the language they use. So, uh, Alida, actually, your question is, is very valid, and I'll just add a couple of things. This is anecdotal and, and subjective uh, view. So, um, my understanding is that the, the likelihood of a meaningful conversation of the diaspora communities in Europe between Muslims and Jews is much more difficult than <coughs> in the U.S. Mm -hmm. that's, that's my feeling. Um, the other thing is that what's happening with the Jewish community in, in parts of Europe is strengthening the, the American Jewish community's views of the insurance policy perspective. Mm -hmm. And they say, look, we need to stand and do whatever we have because look what they're doing to our, to our Jewish mm -hmm. brothers and sisters mm -hmm. in, in France and other parts. So we need to strengthen Israel. And then, yes, I cannot say anything because if something happens mm -hmm. to Israel, my, my brothers and sisters in, in Europe and other parts of the world would have no place to go. Mm -hmm. So it, it is almost like a three-dimensional chess game, which is, uh, is crazy because of these uh, conflicts and how they interact. I have a, a final question, which perhaps could be the closing question, because I'm noticing the time, um, which is whether, whether or not we define ourselves as diaspora or just members of American communities. Uh, America clearly has an influence on this conflict, perhaps a diminishing one. And I'm interested in what you think American communities can do that's constructive towards pushing for not only just a more nuanced understanding, which I feel like we've been getting tonight, but for um, more balanced policy. You know, I'm struck by your comment that, uh, you know, the article on APAC where, you know, they can get the congressmen to write on a napkin at a moment's notice, or that's where people go right after the, uh, the address to the nation. So what, what, what is it that we all can do as community members? I also think about the college campuses. Um, it may be that you talk to each other just fine, but I also hear from a lot of college campuses around, around this valley that there's actually tremendous tension in some areas um, mm -hmm. and polarizing debates. So I'm, I'm curious at, at your thoughts on that. I can start. Mm -hmm. um, actually, this is a very, very important question and probably the most critical question. Um, <coughs> a member of Congress who's a good friend asked me this question, and he said, I want to know who would you support in such a place. I said, I'm not going to support any individual. This is in another country. I would support the principles. Mm -hmm. And the principles are what is good for any American town, many American citizen, from a policy perspective, is the same way I would treat anybody in any part of the world, whether they're in Africa or anywhere else. The, the notion that we can treat certain people from certain other parts of the world with certain other appearances, with certain other faiths, differently is something that should be unacceptable to each and every one of us. We are one human race, we are one group of people, and the policies that are relevant right here in our own communities are going to be relevant in every other community. And those are the principles that we should live by. If a, a, a Muslim is hurting a Jew or a Muslim in Pakistan is treating a minority wrongfully, we should have the same passion to stand up against them whether it's another person from another faith trying to hurt anybody from another faith. And that's the principle that, that I would uh, uh, recommend to all people to follow those. Um, I think, to, to, in a way, to reiterate what I said, right, what the Muslim American organizational perspective, at least, would say as a response to that, is the need to change U.S. public opinion in a way that makes people realize that current U.S. policy is simply not working for the best interest mm -hmm. of the United States. I think that is a major, major uh, component of mm -hmm. it. 
it, it's not so much so bringing it back home, if you will. Yeah. It's not so much about the conflict. Sure, we all have our, our, our own, uh, if you will, um, interpretations and, and needs from a faith perspective or whatever else, humanitarian, to, to bring it into the conflict. But from a purely strategic U.S. interest, U.S. policy towards the Palestinian-Israeli conflict is not in the best interest of the United States. Mm -hmm. And I think that is the message that, at least at the organizational level, these organizations have have attempted to push. Um, so yes, yeah, so I would agree that that the 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 area to focus on is both in terms of educating better, more education of the American public, mm -hmm. um, for whom I mean, you know, in the recent. Gaza conflict. The American public opinion is still strongly pro Israel. I mean, every poll, and this is consistent, and in fact, it's become more so over time. So I, I think um, I think part of it is 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 ensuring that there is um, more public education, and public awareness, um, and greater political accountability for our elected representatives. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, if I mean the reason why APAC can summon um, almost unanimous uh, political support isn't because every congressman supports uh, the policies of the Netanyahu government. It's because every congressman knows that there's no political price to pay if they don't, um, you know, support an APAC bill. They don't have. They couldn't care less about what the policies of mm -hmm. the Netanyahu government are doing. Mm -hmm. They just don't want to have the headache of having to deal with APAC funding their, you know, providing funds to their their, yeah. their their challenger. So if so if we held up a, a greater accountability and actually asked our representatives, what did you vote on this? We do care about this. And the administration as a whole. I would say the, the two things in terms of American policy, just to kind of very brief. First of all, I think is to encourage um, the, the administration to, um, to prioritize making a peace agreement between Israel and Palestine and two-state solution and being willing to uh, to put pressure on both parties to achieve that but also to say it's not enough just to focus on this peace process that you know seems to go on and on at the same time to to uh, to also adhere to a, a commitment to uphold human rights so it's not just about the peace process, which is what most people who care about this issue focus on. We focus on the peace process. That's the way, you know, regardless of whether there'll be a two-state solution or not, and regardless of whether the conflict will be resolved, there's issues about, you know, Palestinian freedom of movement, the ability to build homes in, in Area C, they're not having their homes demolished. Uh, these kinds of, they're not glamorous, but they're the kinds of things that I'm mm -hmm. sure you can just actually on a day-to-day -day basis make much more of a difference to people's mm -hmm. lives. And this is something as well that, that one can, you know, so it's not just about whether you think there should be a right of return. Most people could agree that, you know, there's really not a good reason for somebody who's just built their home or has solar panels installed to, to bring water, that that should be destroyed. Mm -hmm. and, and that's the kind of thing I think you can actually start building a consensus around. No, like, no, okay. <laughs> well, on behalf of, of Critical Connections and Karuna Center for Peacebuilding, uh, an enormous thank you to the three of you. This was mm -hmm. really so instructive and helpful. And thank you to all of you. So, and, um, Malik, is there a sign-up sheet for those who aren't on the mailing list for yes. Critical co Connections events Karuna, and yes. or Karuna events Absolutely. on the table back there? So as you walk out, and if you haven't already done so, if you could just sign up, that would be great. Great. Thank you, Thank you all. Thank you all so much. Thank you.